Hello everyone, the topic for today is we are going to continue talking about the history of Cook Inlet and today we will be talking about the American period. So from 1867 when the U.S. purchased Alaska from Russia to 1971 with the passage of Inksa. And obviously we are still living in the American period, but I'm choosing to um, cut this at 1971 because next week we will be talking about Inksa as well as the many shifts that have happened since then. Now, you might ask, why learn um, the ins and outs of um, the historic period that we're going to be talking about today? There are many, many good reasons. The first one that I want to focus on is the fact that colonial pasts produced the colonial present. Or perhaps we might just as well say colonial pasts produced the colonial presence. Right? You sometimes hear people talk about post-colonialism, uh, but indeed colonialism in many parts of the world is ongoing, or we might at least say that the legacies of it are ongoing, Right? whether or not land is actively um, being taken currently, um, the fact that uh, native groups retain only partial control over uh, key resources in a variety of domains. Um, is a reflection of the fact that there have been colonial restrictions on land rights on a variety of different things, right? Um, I was just saying the other day to somebody that, you know, the fact that we can, for example, talk about the drilling in Anwar and debate it from a variety of different issues, but people sometimes don't even bring up a native perspective or what Alaska native communities in the area might feel about it, pro or con, uh, is a reflection of the fact that there is only partial Alaska Native um, jurisdiction over lands in the far north, oil-rich lands, uh, many of which fall now outside of their jurisdiction. So, again, colonial pasts produce the colonial presence. It's hard to understand uh, the complexities, uh, the positives and negatives, the politics, the, econ the economics of Alaska, of South Central Alaska, of Cook Inlet, if you don't understand this colonialism. It simply will not make sense. Anchorage doesn't make sense without this history. Uh, Sodana Kenai doesn't make sense without this history. Uh, why we have vill native villages such as Aklutna, um or Tyonic, but many of the other native villages that we could point out historically are no longer inhabited. Um, why there was a shift to only certain villages, that's something that you have to understand the history to understand. So it's part of what we want to get at here. Point number two, perhaps a more hopeful um, point, is we're going to talk about a few different stories here, Elizabeth Pratt Pratrovich among many others, um, of resilience of initiative of people at their, either as individuals or as groups who were determined to make a positive change in the Cook Inlet region in Tikatnu, um, some of whom actually experienced pretty amazing success. And so we'll talk about that. And I think that that is helpful and inspiring and important to remember that we too can make change. Which relates to point number three, we are all a part of how this story proceeds. We all are part of this complex conversation uh, that's always ongoing of who we want to be on this land and what we want this land to be. <clears throat> and there are a few things that could help us better have that conversation than understanding the past of this land. So that's the idea of why learn this. And a point I want to make as we talk is the idea of cultural perseverance. What is cultural perseverance? Cultural perseverance is related to the term cultural preservation. Uh, it started; to, it's been used by scholars though to emphasize uh, the idea of not a culture not just surviving, but surviving and adapting. The idea that a culture doesn't have to stay the exact same, frozen in time, for a culture to, in many meaningful ways, continue for the people. Right? The cultural traditions, the cultural values. And so, you know, good example, and there's, I have a picture here of Gwich'in people who have hunted a caribou, but have done so in a motor, but are carrying it back to their community in a motorized boat and obviously have a axe with a steel blade to it, um, not a stone or wood blade or stone or bone um, chopper, but instead an actual steel axe. Um, and then have this, you know, big blue tarp. My point with this picture is, you know, Gwich'in people in rural Gwich'in communities uh, very much continue on a variety, the traditions of Gwich'in people in a variety of ways, including um, a heavy emphasis on the importance of caribou and caribou hunting. And in some Gwich'in villages, like Arctic Village, people still rely very heavily on caribou as a food source and also still carry on traditions of relating to the caribou in meaningful emotional and spiritual ways. 
And yet at the same time, right, people have adopted uh, certain forms of modern technology, as indeed cultures do, right? I, you'd be hard pressed to find a culture that hasn't under experienced some kind of modifications and changes over the past 200 years. Um, so just because a culture has experienced some technological changes or language changes doesn't mean the culture is gone. So I hope with this story of Cook Inlet and Tikatnu, we can talk about, yes, the traumas and not downplay those and talk about just the terrible things that happened, uh, including some of the things that occurred in the American period, but also acknowledge the cultural continuities and perseverance that went on during this time period and continue to inform the rich, rich cultural diversity of Cook Inlet today. So, you know, as we've talked about before and to reiterate, um, it was, this land was Denina land uh, long, long before it was anything else, as well as Alutik Shukpiak land and Yupik land, uh, but most of Cook Inlet was Denina land. and. According to the archaeological record, that goes back at least to 1000 CE or 500 CE when it comes to this er these areas, right? These kind of more southern slash eastern areas uh, seem to have started to be inhabited around 1000 slash 500. Uh, some of those dates are still things we're trying to puzzle out, of course. And so this has been denying a land for a very, very long time. And of course, that's just one way of telling the story and talking about how long. Um, and as Alan Boris likes to point out in his lectures, even when we say that, even when we talk about like, oh, this is when Denina people appear in the record, what we're really saying is this is when Denina villages appear in the record, right? There were obviously people before that um, who were the ancestors of the people who then be started to set up these villages, right? And so Denina people exist in this space for an incredibly long period of time. And so back to the Mona Lisa example from the start of class, we're talking, when we talk about the Russian period and now the American period, we're talking about kind of a sliver of time here, really a very much a sliver of time, uh, but a sliver of time in which a great deal happened. So as we talk, there's going to be kind of a big theme that you might notice that I noticed when I was um, preparing this lecture. I was like, oh, wow, I don't, you know. I mean, it, it's not like the first time it's occurred to me. Obviously, this has occurred to me before, but just like it really just reminded me as I was preparing my PowerPoint and everything um, that, you know, we have these several different stages of the American period in Alaska. We have the Department of Alaska, then the District of Alaska, then the Territory of Alaska, then the State of Alaska. And lo and behold, each time we shifted from one phase to the next phase, it was almost always right around the time that a new resource was found or tapped into. So the Department of Alaska, the purchase of Alaska happened um, at a time period when fur trapping was predominant, right? And also when whaling ships were starting to move in a very real way into Cook Inlet, or sorry, into Alaskan waters. And then we shift over to the District of Alaska right around the time that canneries become prominent and commercial fishing starts to become prominent, as well as gold. And then you have a shift into the territory of Alaska right around the time that um, you start getting much bigger population centers, um, land now as a resource, as well as coal resources in places like the Matanuska Valley, which is part of what led to the Anchorage Railroad, which is part of or the Alaska Railroad, which is part of what led to Anchorage. So again, coal and then land as a resource and the homesteading uh, as well around this time period, military people among many others, um, coming to homestead in a place where they had previously been stationed on military bases. Um, so during that time, we have a shift towards this territory of Alaska, right? We're becoming, we're moving from sort of a military colony that allows some economic activity to then something where you have a lot more economic activity and starting to get more people. And then territory of Alaska, right? We're starting to actually be progressively more integrated towards this model of statehood in the United States. Um, and then in 1959, we have the state of Alaska, which the shift over into being a state um, corresponds to a, a few different resource things, one of which is um, concern over canneries and a desire to regulate um, fishing a lot more. But another of which was discovery of oil. I don't want to oversimplify the matter because there had been pushes to become for statehood long before this, but it was in the mid to late 50s that you had the first discovery of oil in Alaska at the Swanson River. Uh, and it wasn't too many years after that, of course, where we had the discovery of oil in the North Slope, which then also, uh, that happens right after statehood, but of course pushes forward, um, helps push forward ANCSA. 
So again, each time there's a major shift in how we govern Alaska, it seems to be correlated with, right before that, some major new resource that's being tapped into. So it's a good example, one could argue, of resource colonialism, of shifts uh, towards drawing resources from Alaska as sort of a colony of the broader U.S., although, of course, as we become a state, right, increasingly more representation, increasingly more power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the United States. So, a little bit about the purchase of Alaska. Um, we've talked about this before last lecture. There was a few other points that I wanted to touch on that I hadn't touched on last lecture. Um, again, as we've talked about before, from specifically a Cook Inlet perspective, you know, the sort of 1800 to 1860 period saw, um, again, the Russian fur traders, uh, the RIC monopoly, the Russian American company monopoly, where the, the company, Baranov's company, and becomes essentially sort of a paramilitary economic group, right? They are both a fur trading company, but then they also have sort of soldiers and things like that. Um, this is also the time period where you have a major smallpox epidemic in Cook Inlet that here on the peninsula um, kills about half of the population of Denina people. Uh, an incredible collective trauma to go through. I don't think we have a proper frame of reference for what that would be like. Uh, you think about the trauma we've been through the last, last couple of years with how many people have passed from COVID and then just try to just extrapolate that far, far further, right? To say 50% of people, one in two, everybody would have lost people. Everybody would have lost many people to smallpox. And it was in that context, um, as your denying a time travel reading brought up, that we did lose a lot of knowledge holders and there was a lot of culture change as a result of that, right? As elders pass, as certain kinds of stories maybe aren't told as much. A lot of stories did continue, a lot of knowledge did continue, but it had an effect. It definitely had an effect. This is also a time period where there's uh, much greater Christianization, the, particularly the spread of Russian Orthodoxy in Kenai Peninsula. You'll notice I'm not really talking a lot about Ilyamna or Lake Clark or other things um, on the other side of Cook Inlet. Definitely there was a Russian trading presence there and some degree of missionary activity there as well, uh, but it was relatively muted compared to what was happening on Kenai Peninsula. You'll notice also, as well as places like um, what we now think of as Sitka and Kodiak Island and, of course, the Aleutian Islands. You'll notice I'm also not talking a lot about Anchorage area yet, and that is because there wasn't as much, nearly as much Russian activity there. There was some. There was a trading uh, post up there in that area, close to Palmer. But for the most part, well, first of all, Anchorage, as we now know, it didn't exist. That was not a Russian settlement. And the Denina areas there were, um, at that time, less disturbed than the Denina areas in Kenai Peninsula. That would change rather rapidly during the American period, of course. 1867 saw the purchase of Cook Inlet and the rest of Alaska, um, as you would say in Russian, or Alaska, um, from Russia by the U.S. for $7.2 million. Um, some people did ridicule this. A lot of people in the U.S. did support it. It actually passed 37 to 2 in Congress, uh, the purchase, or in Senate. The There was a lot of... Um, one thing I didn't really talk about last time is... So part of the motivation for Russia was that it was a costly endeavor, and although they were extracting resources, it was very expensive. Um, another thing was that it wasn't very easily defendable since they had so few military there, so there was concerns about Great Britain slash Canada invading the territory. Uh, what we didn't talk about last time is there was also concerns, maybe even more important than the British concerns, that the United States would also take the territory. So Grand Duke Konstantin Nikolaevich um, who was the brother of the Tsar, said to, to his brother, we must not deceive ourselves and must foresee that the United States, aiming constantly to round out their possessions and desiring to dominate undividedly the whole of North America, will take the aforementioned colonies from us and we shall not be able to regain them. I mean, put this in context of the time period, right? Uh, the U.S. Um, getting into conflict um, with Mexico to obtain a variety of southwestern lands, particularly California. Uh, the U.S., uh, having tensions with Great Britain to eventually acquire uh, Oregon and Washington. And so it's the U.S., right, that whole concept of manifest destiny and spreading more and more out across the continent. And so there was concerns uh, that the U.S. would take 
Alaska and not completely unfounded. There were a lot of U.S. whaling ships that were going and doing commercial whaling up in the Bering Sea, basically, so in between Alaska and Russia. Um, now, why sell to America if America's doing that? Well, among other things, they didn't feel like evidently they could actually defend it, which is probably true. Their military would have numbered in just a few hundreds, um, and the whalers, the American whalers, were pushing for the military to back them up, or for Congress to back them up. So there was a fear of a clash there, a clash that they might lose, um, and that was not an unreasonable fear, so why not instead, if that's the direction it seemed to be going, instead sell it for $7.2 million, not an insignificant amount of money, particularly at the time, uh, rather than lose it by force. The Treaty of Session was interesting in a number of different ways, um, one of which is that it, in the sense that it... Um, what it had to say about Russian people in the area. So at the time, there was, I've read different estimates. Um, at the time, Secretary Stewart claimed 2,500 people, but others have claimed that it was probably, or that it was more like a thousand. But either way, let's say there were one to 2,000 Russian people um, that were there at the time in Alaska. And um, most of them left. Um, certainly all the military forces left. That was part of the Treaty of Session. But you did have some traders that remained behind, as well as some Russian Orthodox missionaries slash priests um, spread across 24 trading posts. Some of these would have been just like a, a few people, like five people, right? And so some of these were just wholesale abandoned. But you did also have two larger towns, um, what we now think of as Sitka, which is at the time called New Archangel. Um, which is, of course, a base of operations for the Russian Empire, as it became for uh, the American one, and then also St. Paul, off in the Privilof Islands. So you had Russian people spread around several different areas, about um, 1,000 to 2,000. Most ended up leaving right after the sale or right before the sale, uh, but there was a provision in the treaty, in the um, Treaty of Session, that if they remained for three years, that Russian settlers would gain U.S. citizenship. And indeed, some did, and became U.S. citizens, and some of our earlier Alaskans. So, one of the several reasons that to this day um, we have hallmarks of um, Russification of Alaska, right, in our place names and in a variety of other things. And to this day, uh, there's an, still some people who would be able to trace their descent that far back. Um, so that's an interesting part of the history. There was also, let's see. So then we move, sorry, actually this is a really good place to stop. So let's pause there.